Well, to get things started, I mean, most of us have never been forced to work remotely like this, especially for long periods or had the vast majority of our staffs working from home. Um, <clears throat> Over the last few weeks, pandemic has caused many companies to have to switch gears quite literally overnight. And so we're having to embrace this work from home lifestyle, whether we have used it in the past or whether this is fresh and new to our companies. Uh, this has caused a lot of concern for business owners and IT managers, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. I mean, the threat surface and attack surface has widened and broadened dramatically with everybody working from home on their home internet connections, possibly on their home devices, uh, things of that nature. So it's something that uh, everybody's trying to get a handle on. I mean, I've spoken with a number of IT directors lately and uh, if I had to use one word to uh, describe how they were doing. It seems like they're all tired. It's just been lots and lots going on. Um, so in this webinar, we'll discuss some of the, the common easy to do things as just a general computer user that you can do to help keep the company data and your data, as well as the, your company device or your device safe during this time of working from home. You know, how do you make sure that people aren't unintentionally creating a, a surface for cyber attacks? You know, currently, our corporate data is often all over the place. There may be some on corporate servers. There may be some file shares that are attached to a storage device at the office. You may have things in a private data center or a private cloud. And then of course, there's the public cloud, whether it's you know Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, or even just cloud-based uh, software. You, know, you took your, your accounting software to the cloud two years ago, or your management software to the cloud a couple of years ago. So there's many, many, many places that people are, that you're having to connect to from your houses. And unfortunately, the cyber criminals know all of this. They're fully aware that people are working from home, that they're away from those corporate security protections, that they may very well be more vulnerable. And they're taking advantage of this situation. Unfortunately, the stay at home orders that we're all under right now are benefiting those cyber criminals, not hindering them. You know, many people may very well be relying on something as basic as a vast antivirus to protect corporate data right now. And that's just in general, not a good idea. So cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. But why does it matter? I mean, it costs companies and employers millions of dollars every year. I mean, the average breach nowadays is well over a million dollars. It's you know not a insubstantial amount of money to be dealing with as well as um, you know, not only the hit to the brand and the reputation. You know, also, most people have their, their competitive advantage. Their secret sauce is somewhere stored in the company data repository. You certainly don't want your competitors getting a hold of that. You know, why does it matter to you as a staff member? You know, it's often your data being stolen. If you think about it, there are very, very few places other than you know your home or your personal records that have more information about you than the records stored in the HR databases at your company. They have to have lots of information about you as an employee. That's the nature of the beast. So you need to be aware that not only is it customer data, but it's also your data that you're protecting. So you know you have a vested interest in in keeping the company's data secure. You know, and certainly personal identifiable information, protected health information, those are two of the most commonly targeted types of data because in general, they can be sold in big clumps of data on the dark web for people who are gonna try to exploit them, use that information to gain access to your accounts. As you see, there's plenty of different kinds of data. You know, you have your employee data, you've got your customer data, and then there's all the proprietary data regarding your business. The vast majority of this you do have access to as part of your day-to-day -day job. And when you're not under that corporate security umbrella, this data may be more at risk. So what can you do? Well, certainly ensure your PC is up to date. If you were able to bring your work computer home, it's probably being patched and managed by your IT department, but certainly double check. See what that schedule is. Make sure that whatever mechanisms your IT department was using to patch your computer and update, provide updates to your computer can still function with your computer at home. Are there additional steps that you may need to take 
to ensure that your PC is up to date. You know, again, Windows updates, have they been checked for? Are they being installed? Do you have a robust antivirus and anti-malware software on your, on your PC? Now, you know, the, your corporate computer more than likely has both. But if you're being, if you're at home and you need to work on your home computer, do you have good antivirus and anti-malware software and has it been updated lately? If possible, ask your IT department. Maybe your corporate antivirus or anti-malware software could be available to be installed on your home computer. It's often just a licensing thing. Uh, there may be some available licenses that your, your organization already has to apply to your home machine to get those protections in a better place. You know, security is not just one thing. It is layered defense. There's no magic bullet. You, know, you can certainly, and please, use the tools that you currently have available to you. If you're in your, on your home network, wire into it. Plug in. If you're assuming your computer has an Ethernet port, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure that there are a few of you that don't have laptops that don't have an Ethernet port. But if they've got an Ethernet jack, by all means, plug into your home network. A couple of couple of reasons. I mean, it's certainly more secure. You're not on Wi-Fi. You're not broadcasting that information across the open air. Secondly, it's also faster. It's a, a faster connection for your computer. You'll fight, feel it's more more efficient. There'll be less lag. Use the remote access tools that you have been provided by your company IT department. You know, use the VPN for accessing corporate data on on. At your at your corporate headquarters, you know, remote desktop protocol. Log me in if possible. Talk to your IT department. Everybody's got their own preference, and based on the different softwares and the different programs you access, one may be better than the other for you. But certainly, it's a good question to ask if you haven't been given guidance. You should certainly ask that question. Use multi-factor authentication. I cannot stress this one enough. In today's world, no password is secure. And we'll talk about passwords in a little while, and there's certainly things that you can do to make your password less easy to crack. But if you jot it down, or if somebody gets a hold of it, you want some other mechanism to keep some nefarious person from accessing your accounts. The old adage is something you know and something you have. Something you know being your password, and something you have being an authenticator. Most of us just have authenticators installed on our, on our smartphones. I think I've got four or five different authenticator apps. Now, if you work in IT, don't worry. Normally, you can get away with one or two. But those authenticator apps, you can pair up with various um, places you log in, Microsoft Office 365, uh, Google, some other places. And then when you go to log in, you'll have to input a code or approve through the authenticator after you've given it your password. This way, if somebody happens to get a hold of your password, that password isn't the golden key to get into your account. There's still another check. And again, you know, something as simple as your smartphone. I mean, I think all of us carry them with us 24 seven. It's not anything more inconvenient than just having that app installed. Now, follow your company's acceptable use policy. Most companies have an acceptable use policy regarding Devices, what you can and can't do from within and outside of the office. Now, some of these may need to be updated with today's environment. But at the same time, if there's a policy, make sure that you know how it reads and do your best to follow it. And if there's hindrances into that policy that keep you from being able to do your work, talk to somebody, ask them, have a discussion with your IT manager, your direct supervisor, let them know your challenges. Often you can get an exemption to this, or you then you can get the best workaround. Don't come up with your own workarounds. Often they'll violate that policy, and you know I don't I don't want to see anybody violating a company's acceptable use policy. It's it, you know can be grounds for discipline. There's all kinds of different things that go into that, and we just want to stay away from that. So please know what it is, read it, review it. If your company doesn't have one, please ask them to produce one. It's something that's very important for every firm to have on file. <clears throat> Excuse me. Installing endpoint um, endpoint protection. That is something different than antivirus and anti malware. It's a piece of software that would sit on the device that protects that device from the characteristics of anti of viruses and malware. Not from individual pieces of software. It doesn't pull from a database per se. It looks for what those kind of what those pieces of software do, and then bring, erects a defense around a piece of software that runs in your computer that tries to do one of those things, like reach out to 
a server for command and control or for an encryption key to encrypt your computer in the case of ransomware. These endpoint protections are very, very good at detecting those kind of actions by a piece of software and locking them down before they're able to, to run. Uh, again, it's another layer of defense, antivirus and anti-valueware, key, crucial, need to have them. Endpoint protection is another layer, just in case something slips by, it hasn't hit the antivirus uh, tables yet and hasn't been updated. You know, it did, your, your anti-malware software didn't recognize it as malware for whatever reason. This endpoint protection is another layer of defense. You know, talk to your IT department. You may very well have corporate endpoint protection that could be installed on your home machine. <clears throat> you know, and certainly have an understanding of how the data on your machine is being backed up. If you're not at the office and you're not leaving your computer there overnight to run a backup job, are those backups still happening? Where is your backup data stored? You need to understand there may be some folders and files on your computer that are being backed up and others that aren't. You want to understand which ones are and which ones aren't so you can ensure that that crucial piece of data, you know, company report that you've been working on for the last week is saved in a folder on your machine that gets backed up. Heaven forbid something happens to your computer during all of this, but you want to make sure you're not losing weeks worth of work on top of it all. So again, discuss this with your IT, with your IT department, find out how your backups are happening and make sure that you're conscious of that as you're saving your work and doing your day-to-day -day operations at your home. Even with all of that, you're still your own worst enemy. Because unfortunately, social engineering, people want to be helpful. They want to be curious. They're, they're curious folks. People are the weakest link in any company's cybersecurity posture. It's very easy to talk to somebody and get information much, much easier than it is to write a piece of software that will circumvent a firewall and circumvent antivirus and anti-malware to be able to install something on a computer. That is a much, much more technical and time-consuming process than getting a hold of somebody on the phone or sending them an email and getting them to do something that you want them to do. So what is social engineering? It's pretexting. Social engineering is, you know, through, through impersonation. It can be done person, via email, phone, text message, lots of different ways. You know, this is that, you know, I think the stereotypical, you know, from back in the 90s, the email uh, that people get saying that, uh, that they have a, uh, a relative in, in Africa that left them a sum, of, a sum of money and they need to send money to get more money. That's the beginning of social engineering. You know, often there are calls or emails that come out that look like they came from your boss that tell you to go do things that they normally wouldn't ask you to do. But sometimes that identification can be very difficult, especially the good ones. Also IT, especially with us not working face-to-face -face right now, a call from or an email from someone impersonating your IT department. In general, you're going to want to provide IT with every piece of technical information they ask for because they wouldn't be asking if, if they didn't need it. So unfortunately, it goes against a lot of our human nature, but don't be helpful. So what is a phishing email anyway? Phishing emails are a fraudulent email disguised as legitimate. Basically, it looks like it came from a place that you may get an email from. It might be social media, it might be from Microsoft, it might be from Google, it might be from a supplier or somebody that you do a lot of business with. You know, the big things are familiarity, and there's often some urgency or authority that comes in. They're often going to impersonate someone that you are that you report to or that can hold things over your head that may discipline you. Because more than likely, you're gonna jump at that opportunity to take care of that problem or help out that person in that position of authority. So fortunately, most phishing emails are not really all that good as far as legitimate, looking like they're legitimate. There's lots and lots of clues that can be detected. And we're gonna go through a few examples here. So, you know, generic greeting. You know, my name is Kevin Meeker. If I get an email, hi, K Meeker, I know they stripped that from my username. That is not a legitimate email unless I did a password reset or something along those lines and requested information from a website where that is my username. 
Anybody impersonating my boss, my boss is not going to greet me as K Meeker. Sender address being incorrect, incorrect recipient or the two field. Didn't look, doesn't look right. The links don't look right. You know, you're, they don't match their hover. And well, again, I've got some examples for this. You know, familiar brands association, suspicious attachments, you know, spelling of grammatical errors. Those are some of the some of the big ones. You will often find tense issues, you know, where past tense or current tense are not used properly. And then unreasonable sense of urgency. Do this right now. We need these immediately. So here's an example of a phishing email. Once again, you know, Mr. Brute and Mr. Bill Willis, you know, B. Willis here. You know, they're asking you to do things. And you got to confirm your account. Here's some examples. You can see this is a suspicious source address. I mean, MicrosoftOnlineTeam.com. Don't think that's a legitimate Microsoft email address. Once again, we've got our generic greeting, and then there's this suspicious link that's, you know, just obfuscated with the words "confirm account." Other clues within this email. If you mouse over the link, you're going to see where it's going to take you to. And in this case, this has looks nothing like email. So again, a very suspicious link. Hovering your mouse over top of the link without clicking on it is not going to cause any harm. Once you click on the link, that you could cause some real damage. Often, and also regarding the Office 365 team, they're threatening you here. You won't be able to use your email. Just follow the instructions below. This is very authoritative, you know, time sensitive. They give you a you know reason to act. So a lot of these are, if you just take a minute and read through these, you know, these types of emails, you can get a pretty good clue pretty early on that these are not legitimate emails. Here's an example of another one with an attachment. You know, exclamation points, fax delivery generic fax message.pdf from SharePoint. And then there's another link to the fax message. And again, we've got this link will be valid for 24 hours. You only have 24 hours to open this thing. Hurry up and do it. We're trying to instill that sense of urgency. Look at all of these various things. You know, it requires action for your review. Incoming fax to incoming fax online corporate notification here under the to field. That's definitely not something that normally that would be to you. So lots of clues here in this email, but it just takes a moment to stop and look at them. Sometimes we get so caught up that we're just trying to get through it. So especially with email, review it again before you just randomly start clicking on links. Some of the things you can think of, you know, were you expecting the email? Do you often get attachments from that sender? Does that sender send you links? Are there alternative access options? You know, if this is like a password change email, well, if you get an email from LinkedIn that says you need to change your password, well, instead of just clicking on the link, maybe open your browser and go to LinkedIn and see if it prompts you for a password change there. You know, navigate to it on your own instead of letting a link take you there. You know, look at that email for authenticity. Is it free of any phishing clues? You know, look through it. You know, do that quick guideline, you know, quick check. Does this all look right? And if it doesn't, be skeptical. Find another means to confirm. If you get that, you know, urgent email from your boss about buying gift cards, call your boss, double check. He's, that person is going to be thankful that you did rather than buying, you know, $50, $100 Amazon gift cards and sending him, I mean, the phishing email person, all of the codes on the back. Email is probably the number one way that people are gotten by cyber criminals, whether it is through clicking on links, opening attachments. And I think the frightening thing is you may not even know it. You may, it may install some little piece of software that you're not even aware of that just sits on your computer and monitors. And then four months later, it looks for a way to strike. Those types of softwares or malwares are probably the most difficult to detect because they're benign until they run and they could take months from when they're installed to when they actually run. So cyber criminals are biding their time. They're looking for that opportune moment. Passwords. Now, again, 
We talked about passwords, multi-factor authentication helps, is a tremendous aid to password, but certainly password complexity and strength does make a significant difference. Certainly mixing characters, you know, whether it's, you know, the special characters, your numbers, um, capital lowercase letters, all of those are important. Avoid the leading and trailing characters. It's so easy to, you know, have that exclamation point password nine, and then when it's time to change your password, it's exclamation point password eight, and so on and so forth. Don't do that. It makes it far too easy for people to crack those passwords. You know, standard capitalization, the common replacements, you know, three for E, one for L, zero for O, at for A. Those have been around long enough that they don't even make, they don't even cause the cyber criminals to even stumble. They don't even hesitate. They, they write their programs to look for those substitutions and to make those substitutions on their own. So that's not really obfuscating things as much as most of us would like to think. So certainly avoid easily guessed passwords because unfortunately social engineering is very, very common. There's a lot of information out there about you that people can gather from public internet sites. Between Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, somebody spends 20 minutes and half an hour looking over your various profiles, they'll be able to gather a lot of information about you. Family members, dates, you know, your birthday, your anniversary, graduation, things of that nature, your favorite foods, who you're associated with. I mean, there's lots of various things that they can, they can glean from those publicly facing social profiles. And then they can work those into their attempts to gain access to your systems. And so by all means, avoid things that are easily linked to you in public. Don't use your family members' names as part of your password. Don't include your anniversary date in your password. Don't include your favorite sports team. Don't include your favorite hobby. Those things are far too easy to find out about you to be included and used in a password. So avoid duplication of password. Strength is secondary or frequency. Do not use the same password for every website. If you're using the same password for every website, if you take anything away from this, please go find and create unique passwords for websites. If that's a problem, if that's an issue for you, by all means, get a password manager. There are plenty of them around. You know, LastPass, Keeper, there's a few others. You can use them to manage your passwords. Never transport a password between work and home. Don't use the same passwords at home that you do at work and vice versa. That then, and if somebody happens to compromise your work account, now they have access to all of your personal accounts as well. Another big thing that most people don't think about is use a pass phrase. Don't use a word, use a sentence. Now under the easy to remember section there, the lake looks lovely. It's a 21 character password. It's the spaces count. Lake Huron is only a 10 character password, even though they tried, it looks like we tried to obfuscate things by replacing some characters. That 10 character password is going to be crackable within, you know, an hour or two. That 21 character password might take weeks, months, if not a year. So certainly phrases, and again, stay away from famous literary or movie quotes, but at the same time, a phrase is by, all, by far a better and more secure password than just a few, just a, a word or a few characters. It's also easier to remember. That comes in very handy as well. Other things that you should keep your eyes out for, data security. Certainly be aware of any advertisements you get for paid products or services that are advertised as free. You know, click here for your free iPad. There's not a free iPad at the end of that link. I promise you that. They're trying to get your information. Keep your, once again, keep Windows updates and firewalls enabled. Use name brand antivirus. Windows Defender is certainly better than some of those free antivirus softwares. Now, check your antivirus, make sure it's scanning regularly. I mean, just because it's installed doesn't mean it's actually operational. Double check that. You know, avoid those registry cleaners, PC tuner, speed enhancement software, those kinds of things. In general, those act often a lot like malware. If you're having issues with your computer, talk to your IT department. There are far better cleaning things up, making sure that things are running, running properly, getting rid of you know, old pieces of software, things of that nature, than any piece of software available to the public is going to do. 
don't use you know website software that offer copyrighted materials at a discount or for free that is a violation of acceptable use and a couple and a number of other things just don't do it it's not the appropriate thing to do if you need software or you need access to the website you should be paying for it um, enabling content filtering at home such as open dns i mean open dns is a piece of so is, uh, is software that runs in the cloud that can then filter various uh, various websites or content categories. Certainly ways to uh, make sure that you don't inadvertently browse someplace that you shouldn't be and something malicious installs because you clicked on a link out of a search engine, something of those lines. That's another layer of protection, keep you away from certain types of uh, web content. If you ever get a pop-up that shows up, close it down from the taskbar. Don't just click the X. That X may, be an ob may obfuscate the install Right click on it down on the taskbar and close the window or close the program. And then I know that these are still going around. In fact, I mean, I'm, I've had this uh, hit home not personally, but to a member of my family. Um, we, uh, somebody on my family was socially engineered into allowing someone to uh, technical support to remotely access his computer. Unfortunately, it was not technical support. It was somebody from and probably overseas based on the accent. And he was in the process of installing and encrypting software, uh, encrypting all the files, installing ransomware and encrypting all the files on this person's computer. Um, technical support is never going to call you and request remote access. If they do, you know who you call for technical support. Thank them for calling. Say, I'll call you back and then call them back at the number that you know rings your technical support and confirm they really do need remote access. And this last one's kind of a tough one. Never say sensitive company data to your personal computer. Well, some of you may be working from home on your personal computers and there's not a whole lot more you can do. Um, I would discuss this with your IT department, see if there's a folder that they can set up a backup on on your home computer to ensure that your company data is stored at least in a backed up scenario. See if there's any kind of encryption that might be able to be run on that home computer to encrypt some of the data on it so that it's not saved in clear text. In general, you should avoid saving any sensitive company data on your personal machine. But you know, we're not in usual times. There have to be exceptions to rules. Um, the big thing is awareness. Make sure your IT department is aware that you have to, for your job, save things on your personal computer. And do they have any best practices? Do they have any suggestions? Are there things that you know they need you to do? And then please follow their directions. So to recap. Cybersecurity is everyone's job. Everybody has a piece of this. Everybody has a role to play. Cyber criminals are targeting personnel. They're looking at for the weakest link in the chain. They're not calling the IT department trying to social engineer the IT guy. They're calling someone who they think is a, a target, someone who has access but may not be as savvy. Be wary of those impersonation calls, especially with all of us working remotely and very, uh, very few of us doing having transactions face to face. Never been more of time, a better time to ensure that the transaction you're having is with who you think you're having it with. You know, everybody's going to be very understanding during these times. So if things take a little bit longer to be sure, take that extra time. You know, phishing and spear phishing emails are ramping up. I mean. We've, I think we've all seen it on the news, at least at some point, the COVID impersonation are coming out more and more every day. Donate here, fund here. These are not legitimate emails. These are cyber criminals trying to take advantage of people's altruism, trying to help out society in general. Don't fall for it. Those phishing emails normally contain clues. Look over them. Hover over those links. Look at those addresses carefully. More than anything, change your own behavior. Think about it. I hate to say this, but the vast majority of cyber breaches happen because someone's in a rush and doesn't trust their gut. If something looks wrong, it probably is. Double check it. You know, make strong, complex passwords. I think that speaks for itself. You know, don't use, you know, certainly don't use a link as a password, nor don't use any information that's linkable to you in your password, i.e your anniversary date, your spouse's name, things of that nature that can be found easily 
out found out easily by the cyber criminals about on you on social media and things of that nature. You know, don't reuse passwords, especially between work and home. Keep that separate. I mean, you keep that separate in most of the things that you do. Don't share passwords between the two. And then protect your data. Be aware of how things are backed up. Be aware of how things are protected. Where do you need to store things to ensure that the, that that data is protected and secure? So what's your role? Your role is to be ever vigilant and consistent. Look at those emails. Make sure you're not sharing those passwords back and forth. Pay attention to your interactions. When in doubt, ask. That's not just a catchy catch line because we're ASK. Just ask. Nobody's going to yell at you over making sure that you're doing the right thing. Another big issue, mistakes are an accident. Keeping quiet is not. You click on a link and it takes you to some place and you're just not supposed to. And all of a sudden your computer starts acting wonky. Report it. Don't keep quiet. The longer the software is running, the faster and easier it can spread. The more you keep trying to work with it and live with it, you may be infecting other folks. And hate to say it, but this is kind of like social distancing. If you're if you're exposed, you immediately need to quarantine that machine. Contact your IT department. Let them know what happened. And follow their suggested remediation steps, whatever those happen to be. And if, you know, I hate to say, not try to get salesy here, but if you call and nobody knows what to do, by all means, reach out to us. We are more than happy to engage and help out. We have licensed and trained cybersecurity professionals on staff that can give you coaching and guidance either before, during, or after an incident. So we're there to help. Please don't hesitate to just, just ask. So thank you for your time today. I really appreciate everybody showing up and I uh, hope this was at least informative and gave you a couple of tips and tricks. Uh, next week, we're doing a, uh, a webinar on utilizing Microsoft Teams for working remotely. Uh, since everybody's doing all these video calls, Microsoft Teams is an excellent, excellent way to, uh, to keep your staff connected and keep them collaborating. Uh, we'll be posting this, uh, the recording of this webinar here this afternoon on our, uh, on our resource center. Um, and once again, thank you for coming.